ich. I think we'll wait two more minutes for people to come in and take a seat. Wieso? Ja, so Hintergrundmusik. Ja, ja, ja. All right, I think most people have settled in. Um, so I think we'll start. Um, welcome to tonight's event, um, Investigating Russian, Russia's War of Aggression in Ukraine. Um, we'll start with some housekeeping first. Anyone in need of interpretation, um, please select the correct interpretation channel on Zoom, either English or Ukrainian. And the same, anyone needing interpretation here in the room, please select either uh, English on channel one or Ukrainian on channel two. Um, please also note that tonight's event is being recorded, but the camera is going to stay on us. Um, it will remain on the panelists and not show uh, the audience. My name is Anna Schröter. I coordinate the Investigative Commons, which is a joint initiative with Forensic Architecture, their sister agency Forensis, to advance interdisciplinary human rights investigations and bring together organizations and individuals working in this field um, using different methodologies. I will moderate tonight's panel discussion, which will explore one context which has kept uh, many of us very busy uh, in the investigative comments over the last year, which is the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the hostilities going on since then. The idea for this panel discussion is to explore together how human rights and investigative NGOs have reacted to the events since February 24th of last year and how we can work together to advance accountability for the crimes committed. I have with us um, uh, panelists who I'd like to introduce now um, before I then tell you more about um, our runoff show for tonight. Firstly, to my left, we have Maxim Rokmaniko, who is the director of the Kyiv-based multidisciplinary practice called the Center for Spatial Technologies. Um, CST, as the abbreviation stands, works on a broad range of topics using spatial anal analysis and visualization techniques. And currently all their efforts are directed towards analyzing civilian damage caused by the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Next to Maxim, we have Roxolana Burianenko, who holds a master's degree in conflict resolution and Mediterranean security from George Mason University and has worked for several years in the field of counterterrorism and the rule of law. She is the project manager of the Ukrainian archive with a focus on providing support to international accountability mechanisms. On the screen and with us remotely, we have Nadia Volkova, who is the founder and director of the Ukrainian Legal Advisory Group, working towards the rule of law to meet international standards of due process, strategic litigation at national and international level, and implementing legal reform. She's a lawyer with a focus on international humanitarian and criminal law, and was awarded the Human Rights Award by the Council of Bars and Law Societies of Europe. On the far left, from my point of view, we have Hanna Bakdasar, who is the lead investigator of Bellingcat's Global Authentication Project, and an investigator in its Justice and Accountability Unit. Prior to joining Bellingcat, Hannah worked in international criminal law at the UN and other human rights NGOs. 
And then to my right, we have Anne Badel, who is a legal advisor at the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights. And as part of the International Crimes and Accountability Program, he works on Ukraine-related universal jurisdiction cases and advises on case building and strategic litigation. Anne studied law in Berlin and Istanbul and has been licensed to practice as a lawyer since 19, 2019. Not 19, <laughs> 20. <laughs> um, I will moderate tonight's conversation with the panelists for about 60 minutes before we then open for questions and answers from the audience for the last uh, 30 minutes. Those of uh, uh, you joining us online, you're welcome to put your questions in the Q&A function on Zoom, either in Ukrainian or English, and our interpreters will work on getting them translated. Those of you joining us in person, you can, towards the end of the session, give us a sign to request a microphone when we start a Q&A, and we will pass it on to you. Now I'd like to start this, this conversation first with, uh, uh, with Nadia to ask what ULEC's initial reaction to the invasion of, uh, of 24th February last year was and how this has impacted um, uh, your activities and how they have uh, developed since then. Um, hello, everybody. Um, it's good to see you all, even if online, and um, welcome all, and thank you for your interest. Um, we reacted quickly, I guess, um, considering the circumstances, also because we weren't exactly, we hadn't been new to the subject area. Um, we had been working on armed conflict, consequences, legal consequences of um, the armed conflict in Eastern Ukraine for some years before um, the 24th of February. Um, it's just that obviously the focus had to shift a little bit, not just to one part of Ukraine, but the entire Ukraine. Um, and priorities slightly changed, um, even though um, not, not severely changed. Um, but um, yeah, uh, so we, we kind of decided at that point that it was um, important to um, join efforts, not just you know, work in our own shell, but uh, or join efforts with other NGOs. We are also getting a lot of requests uh, um, and um, offers to help us from international community, which was um, very good and very um, you know, we felt the support is just that we um, also realized that we needed to um, bring some kind of order and structure to all the efforts that uh, picked up immediately following the, the full scale invasion. Um, so that's how the Ukraine 5am coalition was born. Um, and then also several international platforms came to be, which um, all the press analysts here in some way. Um, so um, I guess since then we've managed to establish very pro uh, productive cooperation. Um, and um, obviously um, while the war has been horrible and tragic, um, but I guess the good, the positive side of it is just one way or another, we have to deal with the consequences and it's better to deal with it when we all together and we have the support and we feel like we've been, you know, part of the larger community who care about um, how things are going to pan out. Thank you, Nadia. Um, now, Maxim, similarly to Nadia, you were uh, based in Kiev in February of last year. Um, and I was wondering if you could tell us more what the starting point was for your efforts to document the war and how these efforts have developed since then. Um, yes, thanks for that question. Thanks for all of you for coming. Um, yeah, I mean, I have to say we uh, are, and especially before the, the, the 24th of February, we were a design practice and kind of a, an experimental research practice. And most of our work was directed towards two main issues. One is sustainability and carbon in construction industry. And another one is uh, housing affordability. So we did a lot of things where we modeled cities and buildings to understand things, but we um, didn't really think we will do what we are doing now. 
Um, the night of 24th of February, I remember quite well. We had a call with my colleague, Mikola, whom we are based here now, and we work together. And we immediately started to understand these first strikes. So, you know, we had a, a kind of a rocket hitting a residential building near Kola's house. We were trying to understand where it came from. And um, we were always familiar with the ways to deal with such things because we were following closely the the practice called forensic architecture who some of you will know and um, they're kind of pioneers in in using these architectural tools for understanding um, and for investigating uh, human rights violations so we actually used their methodology to study uh, Babanyar in Ukraine which is an uh, also a war crime, but one that is 80 years old. And we were basically reconstructing the space of a historic uh, massacre that happened in Kiev uh, again, 80 years ago, and basically using the same methodology. So we had the tools in our hands, but we always thought we will apply these tools for, for various different uh, causes. Uh, and then starting from, from 24th of February, literally, we kind of try to look at things and try to understand things first in this very kind of chaotic curiosity driven um, way but then actually something happened um, on the 1st of March a uh, rocket hit um, TV tower that is directly visible from our window in, in Kiev office and it also incidentally Basically, there were two rockets. One of these rockets also fell onto the territory of Babanyar that we spent two years studying. So there we were like, okay, like we got to take a close look at this. Uh, so that was the first project that we did in collaboration with Forensic Architecture, where we basically reconstructed the exact details of that strike, tried to understand the, the nature of it in the most kind of granular form in terms of, you know, where were the civilians who ended up dying as a result of the strike, but also like what is the kind of um, the, the effort of, of Russia at undermining Ukrainian telecommunication networks. Um, and then basically, sorry, I'm speaking for so long. Uh, basically, in the end of it, we, we just stopped at the Mariupol Drama Theater, which is the case we've been already looking at for uh, around a year soon. So that is something we're working on now. And maybe we, we, uh, we talk today a bit more about that, but so that uh, to, to pass it on. Uh, that's roughly our trajectory from sustainability to, to war crimes. Interesting trajectory. Um, thank you, Maxime, and I think we'll come back to the to the Mariupol um, uh, theater um, and your investigation that you're that you're doing. Um, now, similarly to to Nadia and the Ukrainian Legal Advisory Group, Hanna, um, I want to turn to you. Um, Bellingcat has been researching and investigating the conflict in eastern Ukraine since 2014 already, um, and I'm wondering if you could tell us more about how this work expanded um, since the start of the full scale. Um, uh, uh, invasion and what sort of um, additional steps you took to document um, the, these crimes. Sure. Well, first off, thank you for your question. Thank you for having me. Thank you guys for coming. Um, yeah, Bellingcat really got its start uh, in 2014 as a result of the, the downing of Malaysian Airlines Flight 17. And so I think that through that work, they were able to kind of prove the viability of open source information within the context of investigations. And through that, over the years, we've built up a, a knowledge base for working in Ukraine. Um, after the full-scale invasion on the 24th of February, though, we had several different outlets kind of come out of that. So we continue to do the same sort of articles we've always done, uh, deep dives into uh, disinformation, into specific incidences, these sorts of things. And then in addition, we have two new projects. So the first is our global authentication project, which is our formalized volunteer community where people apply, they get onboarded, are given training, and then help us um, geolocate incidences of harm to civilians in Ukraine. And we then place this on a time map. Uh, so you can see in both space and time when these incidents occurred. And we just hit over a thousand incidents uh, this week. Um, in addition, we also launched our Justice and Accountability Unit, 
which is uh, a unit focused on the viability of open source information to be used in courts. And so we've developed a methodology that allows us to carry out an investigation in a way that we believe will be legally admissible. So it takes into account all these things you would with traditional investigations, so chain of custody, um, all these sorts of things that are important and that we almost missed out on in MH17. So really taking from that experience and then elaborating on this, testing it, and now we've launched it. Uh, so we conduct these in-depth investigations for use by uh, domestic, regional, international courts, um, and then also by partners like the ECCHR and uh, others. And uh, in addition, we also recruited a lot more uh, people from the region, which I think was essential to having that contextual knowledge in doing these investigations. Thank you, Hannah. Um, Roxolana, you work with Mnemonic, the Ukrainian archive, and Mnemonic has been archiving conflicts in Sudan, Syria, and Yemen for many years now. And then unfortunately, the need arose to set up a similar program to document um, the war in Ukraine as well. Um, could you tell us a bit more about where you see the work of the Ukrainian archive going over the coming years, how you started about a year ago and how it's been developing? Thank you so much, Anna, and thank you everyone for coming and thank you for ECCHR for organizing today's meeting. So indeed, as you mentioned, um, Mnemonic started this operation from the successful implementation of the Syrian archive in 2014. And then uh, following the successful model, model uh, Sudanese and Yemeni archive uh, were implemented. And then unfortunately the need uh, reason in terms of the creation of the Ukrainian archive. The Ukrainian archive uh, started as a rapid response to the full-scale invasion and uh, shortly after evolved into standalone program. Just to give you a perspective and uh, uh, kind of an idea of the scale and of the developments on the ground in Ukraine uh, throughout the years, so it will be 11 years for a Syrian archive. Um, Mnemonic preserved around uh, 5 million digital records of human rights violations. Uh, but within less than a year for the Ukrainian archive, we already have uh, over 2.8 million digital records of the human rights violations and uh, the alleged war crimes. Um, I would like also to form my answer in terms of, of course, as uh, already Hannah mentioned, we have a similar uh, little bit structure. So we are focusing on the public investigation reports, which would be a fact finding pillar um, and uh, some of the investigations already available on our uh, website. And besides that, then, of course, we're supporting the uh, accountability mechanism. So that would be more as the um, legal pillar. Um, besides that, um, I would like to stress that the inception stage of the Ukrainian archive uh, project started mainly on the collection and the mass preservation of the digital records, of course, with the support and the joint effort of our partners like Bellingcat, like Conflict Environment Observatory, and Ukraine 5AM Coalition were one of very kind of main and uh, uh, close partners would be the ULAG and it's great to see Nadia today on the panel as well. So together as a joint effort, uh, we collected uh, different uh, digital records in terms of the under the different thematic segments like the attacks on the medical facilities, uh, also uh, civilian infrastructure, as well as the cultural heritage and uh, environmental uh, objects. So now after the inception of the project, uh, we after this mass uh, preservation of the digital records, we would be scaling up on the investigations and specifically adding um, some like thematic focused investigations jointly with our partners. For instance, we're planning the joint investigation with the Conflict Environment Observatory with the focus on the attacks on the environmental um, objects. Um, then beside that, in case if we are receiving some legal requests, then of course we will be 
uh, seeking the support, uh, the, uh, the legal support and the knowledge um, of the ULAG and specifically the guidance um, from, from Nadia. And in case if, um, of course, the mnemonic would be focusing on the open source uh, content and open source investigation and the analysis, but in case that uh, we would need the support for the witness testimony or in case, in case we need the support for their advice for our expert with uh, a testimony, we would be, of course, seeking uh, the guidance and support of our colleagues and friends from ACCHR. Um, so I guess that would be my answer and five cents to this question uh, as a start. So after the mass preservation of the digital records, now we will be focusing more on the thematic segments. And of course, which I forgot to mention, but it's very important element to focus on the transitional justice that we are talking not only about the accountability, but already starting to think about the peace building processes as well as um, of course, the reparation and the reconstruction as a next chapter to support the Ukrainian society. And I hope that would be uh, starting relatively soon. Thank you. Thank you, Roxolana. And I think we'll come back to this, uh, to this aspect later on. Um, but first, let me turn to uh, uh, Anne, who is sort of, you know, work has already been mentioned um, as sort of ECCHR having accompanied um, uh, individuals affected by human rights violations and conflict from various contexts. Um, you're also doing the same uh, uh, in relation to people who fled Ukraine and are now either in Germany uh, or other European countries. But I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about um, the difference that you experience or that you observe um, uh, from, you know, crimes committed in Ukraine compared to other contexts in which international crimes are being um, uh, committed? Yeah, um, thank you for that question, Anna, and welcome everyone also from my side to ECCHR and also online. Um, so ECCHR over the years has represented survivors from contexts as diverse as Syria, Libya, Sri Lanka and Argentina, just to name a few, and these situations in themselves are already quite different from each other, so it's difficult to put them all under, under one, one umbrella to then draw a comparison, but of course it is possible to, um, to point out some aspects which are remarkable about the situation in Ukraine. And in doing so, I believe it is important to actually um, distinguish between a structural level and a more individual level, and by, th by this I mean the question how do the structures in place actually benefit the survivors? Like, what does this all mean for a person directly affected by the conflict? But um, maybe to touch up on the um, structural level first, um, and I will keep it rather short, or I will try to keep it rather short because it has been said so many times before. But of course, um, I think it's um, uh, without ex exaggeration, it can be said that the conflict is receiving unprecedented attention from the international community. I guess you all know that the International Criminal Court is investigating since uh, March last year already. A um, independent commission of inquiry was set up. A joint investigation team was created by Lithuania, Poland and Ukraine. And also countries like Germany and Sweden and France have opened investigations into the situation invoking the universal jurisdiction or other forms of um, extraterritorial jurisdiction. And most importantly, of course, Ukraine itself is investigating. And this makes a big difference in comparison to other conflicts in terms of um, um, opportunities for investigations on the ground and also forms of judicial cooperation. So this is like one thing which is outstanding about the um, situation, the um, like broad array of um, uh, avenues for accountability um, available. Another thing that I would like to briefly mention, because it is very important for many survivors who um, have fled the war, is of course um, the EU response at the migration level. So for the first time, the um, temporary protection directive was activated, meaning that um, survivors from Ukraine, Ukrainian nationals don't have to go through a nerve-wracking asylum procedure um, and are at least in theory entitled to a residence permit, housing, health insurance and the right to work. And I think this makes a big difference. And I think uh, we could go on like this um, for a while, like pointing out um, maybe some um, remarkable aspects, but um, maybe let's zoom in again um, 
to the individual perspective, because the question is in the end, what does this all mean for a person affected by the conflict? And I think if you're talking to someone, let's say about how a structural investigation in Germany works, um, explaining how to submit a case, one question will of course necessarily come up. And this question is how likely do you think it is that the perpetrator will be held to account and a sincere answer to that question um, in many situations, unfortunately, is um, it's simply not possible to tell this and um, there's no guarantee that a perpetrator will ever be held accountable. And I think, you know, like confronted with this kind of uncertainty, um, a person from Ukraine, a survivor of war crimes might find themselves in a very similar situation to um, persons from other conflicts and um, other scenarios. Um, of course, I don't want to downplay the importance of having um, symbolic recognition. But um, one last sentence, and uh, <laughs> I think it's, uh, this is actually the uh, role of NGOs to, to sort of trying to bridge the gap between the structural level and this individual level, uh, making this, the structural level accessible um, to, um, to people directly affected by the conflict. Thank you, Arne, and maybe we can come back to some of these uh, uh, issues again, but I want to turn to uh, to Hannah and, and Roxolana again um, to see if you can give us a more detailed insert, insight sorry, on how the process of collection and verification of this digital content um, uh, uh, goes and how you select the incidents or the information or the content um, that it is that you are um, uh, uh, documenting and, and archiving. Yeah, so I'll focus on the investigative side of things and Roxelana will uh, talk about the collection and tagging portion. Um, so for this, we start with trying to identify the civilian harm at play. And in the beginning of the war, we weren't sure what we should be doing. Uh, you know, there was so much open source content coming out. Where were we best placed to contribute in a meaningful way? And so that's why we decided to start looking at instances of harm to civilians or civilian infrastructure. And this is all just what we can see visually. So at the point where we're making this determination, we don't know if you know that building that is a residential building was being used as a base or something like this, but it's just on the surface what we can see. Um, and so we do this, we go through all forms of social media, VK, Telegram, Facebook, Twitter, and really just try to see what we can see uh, visually and um, make that determination. So that's the first thing we look for this civilian harm. Then we go through and we have to check for its authenticity. So is this Ukraine in 2022 or 2023 or 2014? Is this actually Ukraine? Um, and then do other authentic authenticity checks. You know, there was a lot of um, fear about deep fakes. Uh, I've seen very little actually in reality, um, but we also saw instances of um, video games being portrayed as uh, war scenes. And so you have to do these authenticity checks. Then we go through and we geolocate it. So that's where our global authentication project comes in. Uh, they go in and pinpoint where this took place. So they look at the video and look for specific things that they can use in order to put this on a map. So is uh, a street sign visible? Uh, can you tell by the um, way the houses are shaped or is there a landmark visible there? And using this and comparing it with satellite imagery, they're able to pinpoint uh, where an incident took place. This is then confirmed by Bell and Cat staff and placed on our time map. Um, it's also then prior to this collected and preserved with our partners at the Ukrainian Archive. Uh, and then for our justice and accountability investigations, which I mentioned earlier, which are these more in-depth ones, we have a triage process where we go through and we select incidents based on things like, um, you know, can open source help this in a meaningful way? Um, are, is there a high number of victims? Can we actually do something with this? Are there, is there an interested party? Um, and then here we really drill down into the, the nitty gritty of what happened here. You know, some of our investigations are over a hundred pages looking into all things relevant. You know, was this building, how was this building being used during, before and after the attack? Um, who was impacted? Uh, we do a gender analysis, all these sorts of things in order to have a really well-rounded 
picture of what happened uh, without making any legal determinations ourselves. And so I think that's really important because we're just doing the analysis and we will give it to the uh, proper people. We do have lawyers on our team and we are informed by the law, but we think that uh, in the end, it should be the prosecutorial authorities that will make these determinations. Works well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And thank you, Hannah, for your answer. And actually wanted to, to mention that Hannah already uh, touched base quite a bit in terms of the criteria of the selection, which is uh, goes similar for us as well. So I will be focusing slightly on the different elements as well. Um, so in terms of the archiving and the preservation, I think we would we will start from that. We do have the different work streams with our partners, one of them Balinkad and Conflict Environment Observatory, and of course, Ukraine 5AM Coalition, uh, who are focusing mainly on the collection and uh, of the uh, digital records and specifically on the alleged war crimes and the human rights uh, violations, which then we have the different, like if to explain you kind of more visually, um, we have a specially dedicated uh, sheet in a way where we receive in the uh, different links, the URLs for uh, specific imagery or for the video or for uh, any relevant digital records, which uh, could be potentially at risk or potentially with time taken down by the social media platform. Um, and then, of course, it's going through the system of the screening, and uh, we, are do we do perform the mass collection and the preservation, but by meaning that, uh, we're still performing, performing the screening and uh, uh, collection and the preservation of the thematic segments, like the attacks on the medical facilities, uh, like the attacks on the civilian infrastructure, on cultural heritage, uh, environmental objects. So basically, which is very important and relevant material and potentially could serve uh, for the case uh, building. Uh, then after, of course, the, the screening, and if uh, we see that, uh, that it's going through, through the system, then uh, it would be then uh, uh, preserved and uh, saved as, uh, with the support of our D1 software, and we would have it then preserved on the Alpharest annotation platform. Now, if I mention in the Alpharest annotation platform, I would like to stress also the importance of our um, mnemonic protocols and uh, guidelines which we follow. Then one of them, uh, it's a tagging guide, which we have the general tagging guide, which is the work of our researchers. And soon we uh, would be developing the tagging guide specifically dedicated for the Ukrainian archive. But besides that, of course, majority of you already familiar with work pro protocol. It's in a way as the guidebook for any open source investigation, which Balikant, uh, Balinkat is focusing on and uh, we focus on uh, as well. Um, so it's in a way kind of very briefly to describe to you that the process of the preservation and then uh, kind of how, end up the, the, how the information then end up on the uh, Alpharest platform. Uh, in some cases, we do also the manual archiving when it's, uh, when it's needed, but in most cases, this would be the automated um, process. Then when we are talking about the tagging, uh, tagging mainly done uh, manually uh, via our Alpharest platform, but besides that, uh, we also have the automated uh, tagging system in terms of, with the support of the V-Frame uh, for the automated uh, recognition of the cluster munition, which really is the work of our open source uh, investigators. Um, then if uh, someone really, uh, if someone has the questions more in terms of the uh, tagging system, and uh, uh, I would be happy to answer, but I think at this stage, uh, I would really want to stress um, that so far Ukrainian archive been focusing on the general observation tagging, but uh, by meaning that uh, we, of course, um, haven't had time yet, in, uh, and given the scale of the developments and the focus kind of at the beginning of the, uh, of the project to have the verified map in a way, kind of in comparison, maybe it would be of interest to you to visit our website. Uh, Syrian Archive did an incredible job uh, within the years. Um, there is a verified map uh, of their analyzed materials and it's uh, really a visual product uh, 
uh, which one can uh, check and 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 see the different attacks specifically on uh, medical facilities and um, the, uh, the 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 other uh, objects. So we are planning to do the same, but so far we've been focusing on the mass preservation of the materials and also selective um, analysis. If someone really have the additional questions, I would be happy to answer. Um, but that would be my brief five cents on this. Thank you. Thank you, Roxolana. Um, and now you've mentioned already the mass preservation and sort of the sheer amounts of, of information um, that you've uh, gathered and that you're sort of securing. Um, I want to turn to, to Maxime, um, who I understand you and your team are, uh, are working on a much more sort of focused selection of, um, uh, of incidents, uh, namely what you had already uh, suggested, the strike on the TV tower in, in Kiev. Um, then you have analyzed um, uh, an attack on the Mykolaiv administration uh, uh, building, and you're now currently working on the bombing of the Mariupol drama uh, theater. And I'm wondering if you could tell us more about how in your research concerning um, uh, these three incidents, but also possible incidents um, that you will be researching in the future, how you rely on, on digital evidence, what role this plays in your, uh, in your work process and research process. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I, I should mention that this kind of slightly um, odd trajectory that I mentioned in my previous comment is um, kind of helping us in a way that, of course, we're very used to collaborate and work with different experts. And it's quite good to be surrounded by all of these organizations that kind of can help us with very specific um, aspects of what we're trying to do like collecting uh, media that it comes with, you know, metadata in a very kind of well-assembled way and stuff like that. So uh, our kind of agency comes a bit downstream from that when we already have a specific case that we're either we want to look at ourselves or we collaborate with um, partners. For instance, the Mekolaev, um administration building bombing was the case that was run by Truthhounds. And maybe that's a good example to explain the, the type of work we do because in the end, the, the, the thing that we focus most is, is spatial stuff and the media. So once there's already a collection of things that are there to be analyzed, we come and we basically look very closely at all the materials that are around. And we can do that for also many different reasons. So for example, with Mekolaev administration uh, building bombing, there was this um, problem that Obviously, there was no um, footage of the strike itself, but there was a, the camera that was mounted on a residential building um, across uh, from the administration, and you could see the projectile fly through the frame. Mm -hmm. And because we knew where exactly that camera is located, and we kind of um, modeled Mekolaev and exact kind of features of terrain, we could basically understand the trajectory of the projectile, which was useful for the case. So our input comes in this kind of um, end of the process where we kind of work with different types of materials, whether those are images, videos, um, or whether those things are something that we need to make. So, so oftentimes we will build 3D models of um, situations when some of these incidents happen and we will try to um, use those as a backdrop for, for the research, almost like kind of connecting all the, all the stuff that we have um, from, from the upstream. Um, and in a way that is exactly what we used to do, you know, like, so basically like this kind of framework of spatial research where you have specific questions about um, something that is important and, and there are a lot of different um, Kind of media operations that can be done to, to help understand that that that's the sort of um, um, the work that we're quite used to. Uh, if that kind of responds to your question, if that, if that makes sense. We will come back to yeah. some of it um, uh, uh, later on, but I want to turn to uh, to Nadia again, um, and we've heard now from uh, uh, Hannah, Roxolana, and and Maxime about sort of, you know, the way this material is being archived, analyzed, and processed. Uh, and I'm wondering if you can uh, uh, if you can tell us more about, from your perspective, what this material, uh, what role this material can play in our accountability efforts. 
uh, and legal processes, and maybe you could focus on uh, uh, on Ukraine, and then uh, I'll turn to Anne uh, to tell us a bit more what he thinks how this uh, this material will be used in various other jurisdictions that have opened uh, investigations. Nadia. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, um, I'm just just a little caveat. We've never used. I mean, we did some. We did have some experience of using um, open source data before, but not on such a scale. So we're probably not the best uh, point of reference on that. We also used. Um, uh, we we um, together with European um, um, European Human Rights Advocacy Center (ERAC) um, in the UK, and together with Forensic Architecture, um, did a, a sort of investigation of Ilovaisk, um, which was one of the you know sort of um, bloody big episodes um, during Eastern Ukraine conflict. Um, but that was the extent of um, sort of we touched very. Um, you know, in the passing, um, we we did all the legal stuff, and then they did all the, you know, the rest of it, technical and verification and investigation. Things. Yeah. So, um, and um, the reason why we sort of it was Iraq's idea um, to involve um, this kind of angle. Um, at that time, it was quite innovative, and it was you know really striking at the time because it was new. But um, the underlying idea was. Um, that, you know, because there was such a great volume of material and evidence to go through. Um, so it's just like in, a, in, 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 in the format of just paper or like, you know, online application or communication, that would have been a lot of letters and a lot of pages to go through. Um, so the idea was to present it in more sort of accessible, clear way for the judges. Um, so as a supplement. Um, and um, I think uh, we managed to, I mean, we haven't had the decision yet, um, but I know that, um, you know, Ukrainian um, Ministry of Justice, for instance, had a great interest um, in, in, in that case, in the, in the way how we structured everything and, you know, the use of this digital um, evidence and digital investigation that we um, did together with um, Forensic Architecture and Eric. Um, so I'm hoping that we're going to build on that um, from our end. And uh, obviously a lot of the um, material, a lot, a lot of the data that's coming in, um, that's going to hopefully form a sub substantial evidentiary um, base. Um, we don't know, obviously we haven't had any, you know, um, consistent experience with using um, digital evidence in, in, in legal proceedings. And Ukraine is, you know, about like steps, 10 steps behind the sort of international community and, you know, like what they did with Syria and, you know, with, with other situations that RNA is probably going to talk about in, in detail. Uh, and our legal system is not um, sort of prepared um, to be that advanced at this point yet. So the reason why we're sort of concentrating still on, you know, on our cooperation with um, with Mnemonic, we're working with um, Human Rights Center Berkeley as well, um, and they sort of, you know, um, guide us in 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 many ways as well uh, because we kind of like first of all doing it for the sake of international. Um, accountability work, but also hopefully, you know, with a hope that Ukrainian legal system will catch up at some point, they will change the legislation so that we can also use digital evidence um, in Ukrainian, uh, when we build Ukrainian, Ukrainian cases, I mean, for Ukraine, for Ukrainian legal system. Um, and I guess, um, obviously, uh, it's not going to be um, you know, we, we can't say that, you know, we would have entire cases just consist of or be built around digital evidence, but I'm sure um, as we progress, um, they going, digital evidence is going to, you know, um, have a more important role to play um, the, the, the further along we move. Thank you, Nadia. Um, and if you say that sort of Ukrainian legal system, they're just starting out on a what is sort of your experience? What do you know about other um, uh, jurisdictions in which uh, investigations have been opened and, and the use of open source um, uh, and digital uh, information? Um, yeah, thank you for that question. So um, 
I mean, of course, from a legal perspective, there are a couple of concerns when it comes to the use of digital and open source evidence. I mean, for instance, admissibility can be a problem as well as strict um, chain of custody requirements. And also, of course, from a fair trial perspective, this can become problematic when it comes to questions of authenticity as well as reliability. But I think these um, challenges can be circumvented when applying the uh, methodology methodology um, as outlined by um, Hanna and Roxolana. Um, and I think it is important to underline that um, the use of digital evidence is not unique or limited to war crimes investigations. I mean, it's already an essential part of many criminal investigations, at least for instance in Germany. And I think we can find as trivial examples as eBay fraud, where, you know, like a chat history may Play, like might play a decisive um, part in um, in um, um, establishing the facts, um, but of course we also find examples of digital evidence, not necessarily open source evidence, but digital evidence being used in universal jurisdiction proceedings. For instance, in the so-called Al Khatib trial before the Higher Regional Court of Koblenz, the um, Caesar files played a decisive role in. Um, sort of shedding light on the systematic torture committed in um, Syrian state prisons, um, a set of photographs taken by a military, um, uh, Syrian military photo photographer who, um, who later defected. Um, so uh, I think the um, use of digital evidence has definitely become part of the tool set of um, prosecutors. But um, going back to the situation um, in relation to Ukraine, I mean, the question is, of course, how to combine um, documentation and accountability, how to um, avoid having a lot of documentation and little accountability. Um, and of course, this is a challenging question, but um, I think, um, and I guess like organizations like Ukrainian Archive and Bellingcat are already doing this, this as we've heard, um, it's important to, um, to sort of um, consider the um, legal demands when it comes to um, evidence collection. And by this, I'm, I'm not only referring to the um, procedural questions, but also to the question whether the um, elements of crime can be established on the basis of the evidence collected. And another point, I guess, which will be important is to not focus on, not only focus on crime-based evidence, but also linkage evidence. And by this, I mean um, evidence that can connect um, a certain act of atrocity to a specific perpetrator and this can like can be particularly difficult when it comes to remote attacks for instance missile strikes where it's sometimes hard to find out um, who actually um, was responsible for um, uh, for this attack so um, these are just some observations observations but you've already sort of suggested my next question that I wanted to uh, uh, to to pass to Roxolana and Hanan so how do your efforts contribute then to case building um, done either by actors such as uh, uh, ULAC or ECCHR, but also um, uh, the ICC or other uh, uh, national authorities? Yeah, so we had our methodology, which I touched on, which was developed over several years of trying to test how we can conduct investigations in a way that will be legally permissible. Uh, and so we started this work back in 2018 or 2019 with work on Yemen. And then we've tested this work. Uh, and so that's kind of been the basis for this. Um, so now we're carrying out these investigations following this uh, protocol, which will hopefully allow anyone who's interested in order to use our material. And basically we just painstakingly document everything. So you don't have to take our word for it. You can really go step by step and see how we got to that conclusion and go from there. Um, Roxelana, do you want to reenact sort of? <laughs> yeah, thank you, Hannah, and thank you, Anna, for the, for the question. Um, I would like to build my answer uh, following the successful implementation of the, of the Syrian archive and specifically how uh, throughout the years uh, contribution to the different case building and, and support of the accountability uh, mechanisms been done. I hope that we really will follow the same path with the Ukrainian archive. 
Uh, what I would like to say that, of course, the, uh, the legal requests and, and the work on, on the incident reports, a comprehensive analysis uh, already is going on, and uh, uh, we're already focusing on it quite a bit. Um, I, we're following the uh, protocols and the methodologies impl uh, implemented successfully for other archives, and as maybe uh, quite a few of you already saw the different articles how uh, Syrian archive contributed in practice uh, in terms of the support of accountability work and uh, um, case building. Um, so that would be the same in a way uh, pattern for us uh, and the path for us to, to follow uh, in terms of the support of the different war crimes unit as well as uh, in, uh, international accountability uh, mechanisms and in terms of the uh, structure of the incident reports, I, I just would like to add that it's very comprehensive analysis with the verif uh, with verification and with the specific incidents. And uh, when we are looking into what as I had not uh, uh, touched base on that in terms of the when it's happened, uh, in terms of the jail location and uh, uh, other. Uh, other criteria which help us to uh, uncover those elements during the comprehensive analysis. Thank you. Thank you. And then to turn to to Anna um, uh, again, um, we we understand now that there's sort of uh, investigations uh, uh, open in various um, uh, jurisdictions already. Uh, and what is the relationship between the interventions that uh, NGOs? Uh, uh, such as ECCHR make um, in ongoing accountability processes, um, either on a national level or uh, or those initiated by the ICC um, already. Um, I mean, I guess, I mean, like, unfortunately, I cannot share any details about interventions um, that we are currently working on, but maybe um, hopefully I can give you um, a somewhat satisfying, more general answer to your question. So, um, I think, of course, as an NGO, we have to ask ourselves, what is our role in light of all these um, accountability efforts that are already underway? Because we don't want to simply imitate um, the work of the prosecutors. Um, and I guess our answer to this question is um, we um, try, which we, um, we are pursuing a survivor-centered approach while also man maintaining a strategic focus. And by survivor-centered, I mean that we are trying to enable um, survivors of grave crime to effectively exercise their rights um, in criminal investigations. And this also includes, for instance, um, facilitation of psychosocial support if needed. And we are trying to um, ensure that legal representation is provided like by external lawyers and um, some of you um, might be asking yourself the question, why is that um, important and necessary? And I guess the answer is from our experience, we can see that there is a great risk of um, um, that, that you know, survivors um, cannot exercise their rights in, in proceedings because they are treated as mere um, providers of information sometimes. And um, we try to um, avoid that um, by um, offering our advice. And in terms of... Um, uh, um, in terms of a strategic focus, I mean, just to um, briefly outline this, um, I mean, international criminal law offers a couple of options to actually frame atro atrocities that are taking place. For instance, if you um, qualify something as a war crime, it means um, we are talking about uh, serious violations of um, the customs of war. But if we are talking about a crime against humanity, we are talking about a widespread and systematic attack against the civilian um, population. And in that sense, um, it might be closer to your human rights perspective because you have a stronger focus on, um, uh, you know, like um, civilian population. So the, these are just ways um, in which you can sort of shape um, investigations to a certain extent. And uh, Nadia, you've mentioned already, and I think Anne also mentioned it, that um, also Ukraine very early on um, uh, sort of took steps to, to open investigations uh, into crimes committed um, uh, as part of the war on their, on their territory. And I'm wondering if you can say, tell us more about how uh, the Ukrainian legal advisory um, sees its role in, this, in these ongoing investigations, how they, um, uh, how they intervene and what role they, uh, you play. 
Um, right. Um, okay. It's our role is probably I can call it multifaceted or multidimensional. Um, as I mentioned, we've been doing this since pretty much 2015 um, as a team, and um, early on we. Um, sort of when when armed conflict, the armed hostilities in Eastern Ukraine broke out, we sort of um, we saw that um, domestic system wasn't prepared to deal with this type of these categories of crime. Um, and um, instead of sort of criticizing them, we decided that, you know, it'd be more conducive um, to achieving better results um, by helping them um, as much as possible. So in a way, while we were sort of doing strategic litigation and um, arguing that Ukraine um, couldn't um, provide um, a proper remedy to the victims, we also were playing in a way devil's advocate and trying to help them out to actually get on with, uh, with um, you know, their investigations by providing um, sort of trainings to them and um, bringing in experts who could sort of guide them um, to consider international standards which um, haven't been in, you know, part of Ukrainian legal system pretty much. Uh, but it's important because the crimes are of international nature and you can't just say that, you know, we are going to be ignore the international element of it and just, you know, do whatever we fit, we, we consider, you know, um, important from the domestic perspective. So there's a large... Um, sort of discrepancy uh, between what um, our national domestic authorities and how they approach the investigations and what they should really be doing. And we try to bridge that gap. Um, we continue to do so. I mean, the situation hasn't changed much. If anything, it's worsened uh, with this, the full-scale in, uh, invasion because of the large scale of um, alleged um, atrocity crimes uh, committed. And unfortunately, domestic system is overwhelmed and um, yes we try to support them as much as possible we have um, uh, a training program um, we also do it in partnership with um, with our international um, NGO partners um, they support us in these endeavors uh, we also um, try to guide them you know informally in the sense that you know through strategic litigation but also um, the fact that um, while we're doing these cases and because uh, um, it's, it's still um, as important for us uh, for the national system to to be able to prosecute and to investigate and prosecute these crimes we also um, you know victims interests and victims rights are important to us so we have to always balance the two and um, it, it's 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 difficult but I think we kind of managing to succeed in a way because you know we um we moving we're moving um along this um wall <laughs> immovable wall uh, and it, through the trainings at least we see the response and interest and 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 the the intention to do better and to um change i mean it's very slow um it's, you know, it's, I can't say that it's, you know, is going as fast as we would like it to go. It's, the progress is very, very slow, but I think there is progress. And I think that's what it's, you know, that's what's important. And um, I had a conversation with someone from the um, Office of the Prosecutor of the ICC the other, you know, the, the other months. And um, um, he kind of sobered, sobered up a bit, um, everybody in the room by saying that, you know, uh, people want justice very quickly like they, they, they want not not the quick justice but you know for things to happen in international justice quickly uh, but they don't realize that it's not a quick process generally by nature so we have to be patient and we have to be persistent and we have to persevere um, and I think also use um, as many options and instruments that we have and also maybe even be creative and develop some new ones and you know um, I think that's the way forward. All right, and before we open to, to the audience, both online and here in person, um, I'll have one last question to Maxime. Um, so it's something that Roxolana already alluded to earlier, Nadia now again, um, is that sort of, you know, justice um, uh, is oftentimes slow, justice processes um, uh, and long, um, and that they extend or can extend beyond sort of 
strict legal or criminal um, uh, uh, accountability. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more how you see the work of the Center for Spatial Technologies, um, uh, the modeling of situations, of locations, et cetera, how you see this could fit in, uh, feed into such an, whether it's an accountability or a transitional justice uh, uh, process. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, in all of these cases, whatever, uh, whoever we are collaborating with, normally there would be part that kind of works towards those kind of legal um, cases. But our main interest is in kind of showing exact details of certain uh, situations. And especially like in kind of spirit of what Arne said before, where you know, so oftentimes it's it's immediately that people tell us, oh, this is unprosecutable. There's still um, kind of a strange feeling that on the other hand, there's a lot of these things that are going on. Like for example, when we study Mariupol um, drama theater case, it's, it's kind of impossible to uh, participate in these conversations of whether it's a crime against humanity or war crime or an instance of a genocide in, in these legal terms when you also know that there's a kind of country that occupies Mariupol that frankly doesn't even care about international law. And like, there are people who escaped Mariupol who, you know, saw these things and they we work with them, we interview them and, you know, they want to see that there is something uh, going on around this. And I think the the kind of the most boiled down function of what we're working on now with Mariupol Drama Theater is kind of providing them the, with the sense that there's a reality at all. Because in, for, for, for many people who kind of touch these things, for a lot of Mariupolites, they don't even kind of, um, I mean, you know, when you, when you go through things like that, you sort of don't, believe in in things and and one of the very simple thing that we do is of course assembling all of the materials around a model and then creating this micro universe where actually the human matters where we have all of these photographs preserved including the photographs we receive from our colleagues but also oftentimes witnesses share things with us um and you know like especially after talking for six hours to a witness they suddenly find out that they have actually photographs that they didn't want to show before um or they bring some things like for instance one of our witnesses brought to us this drawing that he made of Mariupol theater which was extremely precise like it was super good um and yes yeah, so, so in in that way the work kind of is somewhere in between kind of being a basis for potential kind of work that can be done on those cases but at the same time kind of being out there and kind of like preserving materials around these very specific instances that kind of we think matter and also matter not only in terms of uh, legal uh, things but also you know um, like for instance Mariupol drama theater is a twice um, historic kind of landmark it's it's a historic building it has a historic sculpture on it and it's 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 basically um, the heart of the city like every Mariupol knows that building so yeah building these little islands um, around these these cases is something we have to define better but that's kind of the, the current work Okay, thank you. Um, I see we have uh, a question in the coming through Zoom already. Everyone, uh, anyone else here in the room who would like to ask a question, um, please sort of raise your hand or make yourself noticeable. Um, and my colleague Alina will go around um, to, to share um, microphones. Um, but in the meantime, I'll start with the uh, first question, um, which um, I'm going to direct to to Hanna and or Roxolana, so maybe one of you would like to start and then the other one can uh, uh, can add on. Um, that there seems to be a wide range of organizations collecting data to investigate possible war crimes. Um, and the question is whether there is enough coordination and informa information sharing between these entities, or is it a challenge um, that is being considered um, and tackled? so as to not uh, jeopardize um, uh, efficiency. 
Yeah, sure. I can go ahead and start. So with this uh, with this question, I I would like to, to to start first of all, for instance, when we are selecting the cases for the public investigation, like one which I mentioned previously, which I will on our uh, website. Um, so that was a beginning of the invasion. Uh, it was the, mainly the incident focus on uh, incident which happened in Jatomer. Uh, and mainly the destruction of the civilian uh, public infrastructure, but also the medical facilities were uh, impacted as well. Why I started my answer with this uh, example, um, when we are selecting cases, we making sure that that would be the incident, uh, the, that would be the incident which not broadly covered by other stakeholders, because I believe and, uh, and our team that it's very important to bring the uh, visibility and then also strengths the, the, the importance of certain developments in, in the other regions of, of Ukraine, let's say, not only uh, if we are talking about the Mariupol drama theater, but the visibility and the importance of coverage for the cases like uh, Zhitomer. In terms of the coordination, of course, I agree with the uh, individual who stated the question. It's very important, and there are various platforms uh, and uh, Open Society Justice Initiative, uh, um, uh, Open Society Foundation. They very often organizing uh, their accountability calls, which I believe very important. Coordination platform where different stakeholders, organizations, NGOs sharing their perspective, their development, their work streams. Uh, and those kind of platforms and coordination are crucial to avoid the duplication. Uh, that would be the beginning, in a way, of, of my answer, but then I would uh, refer to Hannah to add a little bit. I think that was uh, spot on. Uh, not much more to add, but I think that everyone working in this space is really conscious of not wanting to duplicate work. And so these, oh, there we go. Uh, yeah, everyone's really conscious about not wanting to duplicate work. So we have these coordination calls. It also helps that Mnemonic is the repository for several of the organizations doing this sort of work. And there is a deduplication done in that stage as well. Um, but yeah, I think Roxelana said it perfectly. Then maybe I would follow up with a question to, uh, uh, to Nadia. Um, you know, we've sort of seen that various human rights organizations in, in, in Ukraine, but also interna internationally, um, uh, have sort of started, uh, uh, obviously, to, to react to this, uh, to this, to this invasion. Um, and how is the, the coordination going um, uh, uh, between you and other Ukrainian human rights organizations, uh, maybe less with a focus on sort of the digital content and the digital investigations, um, but more in terms of your, um, of your legal work? Uh, yeah, as I mentioned in the beginning, so we, um, a lot of Ukrainian organizations came together and um, sort of joined into the coalition. Uh, we have two largest coalitions in Ukraine. Um, one is um, we are members of called Ukraine 5 AM coalition, and we are about 30 different organizations. Um, they are very different in their profile and what they have been doing before the invasion. But obviously now we kind of like united with the same goal and uh, we're trying to, um, yeah, try to make sure that we do everything to achieve it um, as much as possible. Um, and in terms of um, international um, coordination, I guess uh, the platform that Roxolana has mentioned, um, OSF's um, coordination platform, um, is very helpful in, in the way that, I mean, especially at the beginning when we were getting uh, bombarded with, you know, different requests and emails. And so we try to get our head around how we can organize the space um, so that, um, you know, it's, it's, it, it's a little bit more structured than, you know, the, um, the requests are sort of not dupl duplicated as well, because that there too um, and I guess we managed to succeed um, but right now I think um, the space is changing slightly as well from the dyna dynamic that I'm seeing um, now that the, many organizations sort of are on their way to identifying priorities they kind of like you know joining with the similar groups who have similar priorities and so they're breaking they're breaking up a little bit but also joining in a different sort of you know um, in a different context, which is also okay, I think, as long as 
um, as long as um, it doesn't get sort of, you know, we don't step on each other's feet and, um, you know, compete. And I mean, that, that would be an unhealthy environment, but as long as we sort of respect, re respect each other's interests and um, deal with it in a, in a kind of, you know, um, considerate way. Um, and I guess we have probably more chance to succeed uh, because what we see like happening in um, governmental space, for instance, uh, I think they're struggling a lot more than, um, you know, NGO sector, um, because coordination at the government level is a bit, yeah, um, it, it causes concern, but we'll see how it goes. Okay, thank you. Any question here in the audience? Yes, I see someone raising their hand on the far right. If you can, please direct your question to one of the speakers. Yeah, I had a question to the gentleman on the left. I forgot your name and also Nadia. Mm -hmm. um, something really that caught my interest was how you mentioned this, um, the NGOs kind of fill the gap between the, stru uh, the structural components of the state, like the bureaucracy and the community or the individual. And I was just thinking that how like organizations and like people like us, we kind of come in with different expertise, like modeling or like different kinds of legal aid funding uh, to fill this gap. But I was like thinking about what are your thoughts on like closing the gap itself? Because like there are like many forces that create this gap between the state and the individual. And I think there are many questions of like nation building citizenship kind of embedded in it and what happens is that like like the space of the investigation kind of goes much more away from the courts you know um yeah like it's just like a thing that i keep thinking about and maybe like if you want to elaborate on that um yeah sure thank you i mean that's a very big question <laughs> um as it concerns like um i would say in general how um what the state is and how civil society um interacts with the state um i mean completely filling the gap would mean at least in my perspective that sort of everyone who is for instance affected by a crime um gets a very precise and accurate um um, perspective on what the accountability options are and this includes also the question like um, how long can it take uh, what are the chances of success and what happens to the information that I submit um, it also includes um, getting protection I mean like so from a rights perspective I mean we can see many rights enshrined in the um, EU victims rights directive so there you have I mean this is a very legal perspective and I'm trying to sort of like um, getting closer to an answer <laughs> as a lawyer by um, uh, drawing on the law but um, in general I think I mean um, I think there's also some legitimacy to just having um, civil society doing it in a way because it's a more, like maybe a more direct way of interacting and I mean um, you know like on eye level and maybe this is also easier for civil society to be done but of course I think um, there's of course a need for structural support um, by by the state to to actually um, encourage um, um, such um, support mechanisms by civil society. I don't know whether this is, but I'm happy to talk about this in more detail afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, we can maybe you can continue the conversation. Nadia, did you have anything uh, uh, to add? Because I think it was directed to both of you. Yeah, just, uh, yeah, thank you so much for that question. I think it's really important. Uh, it's also <laughs> very complicated. Um, and um, I heard two parts. Uh, one is the gap between. Um, the sort of the society, whether it's, uh, it's civil society or it's people in general and the state. Um, and um, I mean, using example of Ukraine, we see a lot of it right now. Um, and I think um, while prior to invasion, things haven't have, had been more subtle in a way, right now they're more in your face. So, and we see a lot of it happening with this initiative on tribunal, um, with tribunal on aggression. Uh, because obviously, uh, first of all, it's a government initiative and um, the government, the office of the president, the government's pushing it, but they've done it in a way that um, sort of it didn't have anything to do with the interests of victims or 
you know, so it was just fed to the society. It was never sort of debated, people weren't asked, no, nothing was ever explained. So it was, you know, government knows better and, and, and we relinquish sort of, it, it, it's, it, it's a given that we have to relinquish sort of our, you know, our right to participate in these discussions. And I think, I think um, this is an example where the government could be more considerate of people's will um, and uh, maybe work better, engage better with society, even if it's via civil society um, or, you know, any other form of engagement, that would have been nice. Um, and this is something that we're trying to change, at least in Ukraine. I don't know whether it's, you know, applicable to other states or other countries. Maybe this sort of engagement and interaction is a lot more effective, but this is something that we're missing here right now and is becoming um, an issue that we have to tackle um, as a society in Ukraine. Um, and another thing is obviously engagement with um, government authorities um, in, uh, at the operational level, I guess. And um, it's important that we do that because we are the sort of the link between the people, the survivors, the victims, and then the government institutions. Um, in particular, in this case, in, in the accountability space, um, obviously it's investigation, investigators, prosecutors, and judges. And I think it's very important. I mean, our role um, is bridging, you know, again, that gap in the, in the way that we're doing it, you know, to the best of our ability. And we are not sort of, we are doing it professionally and we're doing it, you know, um, clearly understanding why we're doing it, not because, you know, we kind of want to make money or we, we want to become a famous NGO. We want, you know, if you are in that space, you have to understand what your standing is and why, you know, exactly why you're doing all of this. And I think that could help as well. Thank you. I see, I saw a hand there. Uh, okay, the two uh, women in purple. But yes, you go first. <laughs> um, hello, thank you very much. Um, I saw yesterday, sorry, is it okay? Like, yeah, sure. <laughs> yesterday I saw a movie called um, The Lost Souls of Syria at the Friedrich Ebert Foundation. And it was basically about the um, military photographer you mentioned, um, Cesar who still is undercover. Um, so my question is, it's such a harsh contrast watching that movie, seeing the um, secu security aspect of it and watching you here so brave. And um, I don't know, have you had any um, threats? Have you have um, any, I don't know, security issues? Are you being supported by, I don't know, government secret service? entities I don't know I just wanted to know if that's an issue because it's I don't know it's like being a completely different um, scenarios yesterday and today yes maybe I'll pass it on to sort of this side of the of the of the panel in case Roxolana Maxime uh, also Nadia if there's anything in particular you want to share or if you have to no <laughs> um I mean, I would probably answer the question that uh, whoever is working uh, on accountability work, and specifically in this case, if we are talking about uh, uh, conflict in Ukraine, uh, one needs to be very, uh, in a way, careful and, and following the security protocols when conducting the investigation. Uh, and for that, we have a really good guide at the Berkeley Protocol, which we mentioned originally. Uh, Hannah and I, I believed when we started the description in a way of the investigative process. Um, that would be in a way, uh, in a way, my answer. But of course, I, I would stress the importance of uh, following the, the security checklist and, and uh, making sure, especially when conducting the investigation for the other researchers, uh, to make sure to follow those uh, the, the, those the advices and those those steps. So thank you. Maxime? Um, I mean, the only thing I, I can say is that also there is a, obviously a big difference between the two cases. Like, as Arna said, there are Ukrainian organizations who prosecute more crimes. So it's not like we have to worry about Ukrainian. Uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit of a different context. 
Right, and I wanted to see if Nadia had anything to say, but I fear she's not there anymore. Do you still see her? No? Okay. Um, we have 10 more minutes, and I know that there was one additional question. Ah, okay, several additional questions. Then maybe we'll try and keep our questions brief, if you could direct them to a specific panelist. Um, and I'm wondering whether we should start collecting questions. Maybe you can uh, raise your question first. Yes, thank you very much. Thanks for, for your contributions all. Um, I have a question to Roxalana and a bit because you mentioned also that you that you were in touch or you you were looking also at the, the Syrians archive, how do you work? So my question is a bit broader. Also, how much you are in touch with these different groups, like also here in exile? Now, you are not exactly in exile here in Berlin, but but many are, like the Syrians are. Um, how much this, this there is and there is a, a network between uh, organizations from different uh, uh, war situations to share experiences, share exactly how how your work is. Is this or is this just for a time being when you are done with your mostly work? Thanks. Thank you for your question. Pose my question. Um, I had two questions. One is about the um, most of the digital evidence that you mentioned. It seemed to be primarily visual, and I wondered if there are also other ephem ephemera, um, such as sonic or other um, that kind of goes beyond the visual um, realm. And so this is a bit the question for the three people at the end. And then the second question I have is the. Um, it was touched on by mnemonic, um, this question of um, transitional justice. Uh, and I was reading an article recently on the Syrian war archive and the sort of maybe skepticism towards transitional justice uh, for people on the ground um, versus people in exile. And I wondered what the case was also um, with the, the Ukraine case, if there's a, a different attitude. Um, and then Maxime, you you touched on um, also the catharsis also of the victims is maybe this is an aspect of um, um, I mean, maybe it's it's too soon, but um, is this also a goal this um, transitional justice. Maxime Roxolana, Hannah. <laughs> or maybe. Okay. Yeah. Yes, let, let me probably then start and address the first question which we received from the gentleman regarding the coordination of the Syrian archive and the Ukrainian archive. Uh, so we are the, the two archives are under the same, uh, um, it's under the same organization, under the same umbrella of mnemonic, and uh, we are successfully implement. It. We are following the successful implementation of the tools and methods and the lessons learned and the good practices. Uh, which were followed by the Syrian archive. And one of our first, uh, in a way, joint project and uh, also the uh, joint pa panel discussion. And when, when, of course, when we were presenting our first in public investigation on Jatomer, which I mentioned uh, before, and it was also the sixth uh, months of the full-scale invasion. It was in, in September of six months of full-scale invasion in Ukraine. So we, in a way, compared uh, um, different uh, incidents which were ha which happened previously in Syria, let's say, with the attacks on the medical facilities and the uh, public infrastructure, the same what we looked into uh, in, the, in the Ukrainian case. Um, so as you know, uh, and, and you, uh, I'm sure, read the, the, the different articles and, and you saw it before that uh, a Syrian conflict in a way it's one of the most documented uh, conflicts, but of course with the uh, developments on the ground in Ukraine and I, if I'm, as I mentioned in the beginning of my intervention, that within the 11 years, uh, Syrian archive preserved uh, around uh, 5 million digital records, but now it's less than a year for the Ukrainian archive, and we already have over 2.8 million digital records. But uh, without a doubt, of course, we are following the uh, lessons learned and the good practices, but adjusting to the Ukrainian context, which is very important, because if we are looking from the digital perspective, uh, digital documentation, there are 
um, lots of elements to consider. And if we are looking more from the um, concept or the contextual element of the conflicts, then I would rather start comparing a little bit the Ukrainian uh, conflict in Ukraine and conflict in Chechnya, which happened back in the days, uh, especially kind of in the developments in the winter of surrounding the cities and then uh, putting the, 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 the inhabitants of the cities through this almost starvation and uh, and so on. So I am sure quite a few of you are familiar with those cases. So that would be my uh, answer for the, for the first question. And I hope that, uh, that I answer that. And then in terms of the transitional mm -hmm. uh, justice, if you want me to start or maybe- You can go first. <laughs> okay. um, so in terms of the transitional justice, I believe that this is very important, not only to focus on the accountability and justice, which is, of course, the first step for their for their to look in the future, but also to consider the holistic approach um, to support the, the Ukrainian society to look into the future and to look to the to the next steps, like, for instance, very important element also to consider uh, the reparations and the reconstructions and who's going to rebuild uh, all of the damage done and, and support those communities and support those families. We all know what happened in, uh, in, the, in the area and especially in the Bucha district uh, near Kiev. It's a very picture square uh, area, but unfortunately, given the, the destruction and, and uh, especially in the beginning of the invasion. So, of course, those elements would need to be considered. Uh, unfortunately, at the moment, we're quite far from the from the peace. There's still we all see that the conflict is evolving and developing further and further. Uh, but of course, the peace building and of course the the next steps in a way to look into the future. I believe that it's very important to consider that the next generation wouldn't need to witness what we all witness in nowadays in the 21st century, uh, the armed conflict uh, in Europe. Then maybe Maxime and Hannah, I would ask you if you could uh, uh, respond to the question in relation to the types of, um, I mean, maybe Hannah first visual, uh, sorry, types of material beyond visual material that uh, 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 that you collect. And maybe we can extend this question, Maxime, to briefly also discuss um, uh, how you make use of uh, material other than, than, than visual. Yeah, so at Bellingcat, we usually work primarily with audiovisual material, primarily visual because that's how we're able to reconstruct or geolocate or chronolocate. Um, but I know that there are some organizations that are really focusing on the um, audio component only. So for example, in the beginning of the war, um, there was very poor operational security on the Russian side. And so they were using radio channels that were easily intercepted. And so there are some organizations that are archiving that. Hala Systems, for example, went through and was archiving that sort of um, audio content. We didn't have capacity to do that. Uh, and so that's also a really interesting intersection with how everyone collaborates in a, another way. You know, one organization's specialty is able to take that on, and then another will focus on something else. Um, Maxim. Yeah, I mean, of course, our stuff is at much smaller scale. And by the way, I, I have to say all of it is very visual. So it's much easier to see the work than hear me speak. Uh, but uh, yes, in that small scale, we also definitely work with other different other media. I mean, I, of course, maybe you can say that model is, is also visual because it's the first thing we did was the, to build the kind of use old drawings to build the model. But we also do ask uh, people questions on the interviews and the questions we had the, um, the whole session that is around sound. So um, around 16th of March, when the theater was bombed, there were constant air raids with, with Russian airplanes flying around the city and dropping bombs. So each witness, we asked uh, how often they heard those things, what kind of plane was it, and we played some sounds to kind of uh, for the witnesses to verify what kind of sounds they heard. And also they described uh, in a very deliberate uh, kind of extended way, the, the way that the, the explosions sounded and stuff like that. So on a very small scale, of course, uh, things like that are, are very important. Uh, and yeah, I mean, in our case, we also work with witnesses. So that's not non-visual kind of way of 
just hearing people's stories and also hearing them verify certain answers to certain questions. Like, for example, were there Ukrainian military around the site? That's exactly something that we can kind of cross validate between all the witnesses that we've interviewed. And it's, yeah, that's another example. All right, because we're coming to an end, and I know you have another question, but maybe you can sort of keep it for a, a, a bilateral um, a, a discussion. We have one last question um, coming from uh, uh, from Zoom, where Molly Quell asks if the panelists can give a sense of how much of this information that is being collected um, is being shared with international bodies, the ICC, um, the new evidence center at Eurojust or the European Court for Human Rights um, and how this communication is going. And uh, I would maybe in that invite the panelists to say whatever it is that they can sort of share about these uh, about these communications. And if there's anything else, um, you know, in terms of closing statements that you'd like to uh, uh, include, maybe I'll start with Anne because you're right next to me. <laughs> I mean, so ECCHR is not doing documentation work, so I unfortunately can't give an answer to the question posted to the chat. Um, I mean, I think it all depends, like, I guess, when it comes to sharing of evidence with um, the European Court of Human Rights. I mean, I guess you would need to have a case in order to do that, like, um, like a specific uh, focus, but maybe uh, the others have more to say about the other um, judicial bodies. And in terms of um, a closing statement, um, I guess I would um, simply like to uh, thank my co-panelists for the <laughs> thought-provoking inputs and uh, hopefully the um, documentation work in combination with the accountability perspective will lead to tangible results in the near future. Hannah, Roxolana. I feel like I don't have a very nice answer to give uh, because of confidentiality reasons, but I mean, we are in contact with domestic, regional, and international accountability bodies, but I feel like that's not the type of answer you were going for. Uh, and yeah, I also wanted to echo, um, thank you guys for a wonderful thought-provoking conversation. I really enjoyed being here tonight and thank you all who attended also virtually. Thank you, Hannah. And uh, I, I believe I, I will just echo in terms of what, what Hannah said that uh, that's important kind of in terms of to, to support the uh, local, regional, and uh, international uh, different bodies and accountability mechanisms. But of course, it's very important also to uh, focus on the uh, different sources and the different open source uh, content, different materials, uh, and checking not only, let's say, the Ukrainian channels, but then also the more international publications and all different coverage, and as well as very often um, domestic authorities uh, they they publish in the information and which is accessible before for like for the public access even the national police sometimes uh, they publish on their website straight after their attack so that's very important to consider uh while doing the investigation or, or looking into uh certain uh incidents but in terms of my closing remarks i would like to say that thank you so much uh, for everyone for for your questions for your attention uh, and thank you so much to the ECCHR for organization and convening this meeting today. And uh, I just would like to add that we will continue our focusing on the successful of implementation of the tools and methods and protocols, which were followed by the Syrians of the Nice and Yemen archives, and we will be implementing it in the context of the Ukrainian conflict. And of course, uh, I would like to add to my previous answer in terms of the transitional justice, that with a uh, majority of the people also with whoever I spoke from uh, Ukrainians and specifically those ones who are still in Ukraine, everyone is looking for an end of the war and everyone is looking for the next steps and everyone looking for a kind of rebuild and, and to restart uh, kind of the, uh, the after the, the post-conflict. So I believe that that skepticism towards the transitional justice and the Peace building processes, of course, uh, might exist for, from, from, from certain perspectives or from certain areas, but overall, um, everyone is looking forward to the next steps. And this would be important for international community to recognize not only the accountability and the justice element, but also the uh, reconstruction and the reparation for those 
for that for that destruction, especially in the area near Kyiv, what what happened in the beginning. So thank you so much, and uh, that's what we all from my side. Thank you, Roxana, Maxim. Yes, uh, thank you so much to ECCHR for organizing this. It's always good to be surrounded by these organizations um, and to kind of meet in person, especially after like kind of like briefly touching uh, each other online spaces. Uh, but um, yes, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Um, Nadia, we were just doing a round um, uh, of closing statements. If you had any last things that you wanted to say tonight, uh, but for some reason didn't get a chance to um, to say, then you have the, the, the opportunity now. Thank you very much. Um, yes, also big massive thanks from me for organizing it to, to Yuan and to um, ECCHR. Um, I think that these discussions are very important. Um, and um, because, I mean, we also um, facing a lot of challenges as individuals and, and, you know, it's on the one hand, it's always good to be challenged, but it's also, um, on the other hand, it's also important to feel the support. And with, when this, these discussions that, you know, when they happen, uh, you can feel, you know, the support um, and um, uh, of your colleagues and of um, people who show interest in 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 these um, topics, and um, that means that you know we're doing something right. And <laughs> I wish us all to continue on the same path. And hopefully, I would like to echo Arna here that we actually um, get to um, achieve and you know see um, the results of our work sooner rather than later. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you, everyone, for uh, for coming. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'd also like to thank some other people for supporting um, uh, making this event happen tonight, particularly our interpreters, Daria Pimenova and Olena Petlovana. Thank you very much for the interpretation and translation of the, um, of the questions, as well as some colleagues um, and technicians for a smooth run of show tonight. Um, Thank you to the audience for joining us both in person and online um, here in Berlin. And those who are here uh, with us, you're invited to join us for some networking, continuing bilateral discussions um, over refreshments and, uh, and brittles. And I hope to see you all at a different time, at a different place, in a different event. Thank you.